Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Butterfield from Pittsburgh, and I wanted to talk about uh, biomarkers. So um, you've heard uh, off and on throughout the morning the importance of biomarkers, and what we need to know is who we should enroll in the trial, and we need to know who's benefiting from the treatment in time to change the therapy if we need to, and we need to know the mechanism of action, because without mechanism of action, did the vaccine activate T cells to kill the tumor? Uh, did you stop the immune suppressive Treg or MDSC? Um, did you block that immune suppression? Did you hit the target with your uh, small molecule? Um, without knowing these mechanisms of action, we don't have um, rational approaches uh, to make these combinations. So where, uh, what's the state of the field? Where do we still need biomarkers? And we still need biomarkers for IL-2. Uh, used since 1984. Um, this is from uh, Dr. Rosenberg, uh, writing about 7% complete responses um, and uh, hundreds of patients treated, and yet the toxicities to get that 7%, um, which are severe but reversible, uh, can require hospitalization in intensive care units in order to achieve uh, that outcome for a minority. What about interferon alpha? This is shown in a number of very large studies to offer a survival improvement for a, a minority of patients, um, but it's a one-year regimen, and we still don't know who should receive the regimen for a year uh, with those associated toxicities and who should not. So we'd like to avoid the toxicity and the treatment of that toxicity where we can. We'd like to avoid those ineffective therapies for the patients for whom uh, those are not the right therapy. We need to understand those mechanisms of action so we can build on them uh, and then have rational uh, basis for combinations. So why don't we have biomarkers yet? We have, uh, we have the most important thing. The first point has been solved, so I took it off the list. We have durable, complete responders from immunotherapy. Without those, we didn't have a comparison group to see why things didn't work. Now we've got the responders to compare to. What we don't necessarily have are the right specimens. We don't have them saved under standardized conditions. Everyone in this room has a slightly different immune system, and if everyone's PBMC were processed and banked slightly differently in, someone in, in each of our own laboratories, that's going to introduce noise that may block the identification of that immunotherapy biomarker. And um, uh, immune assays are costly. And so when I do my trial, I pick my two favorite scientific questions to answer. And so I find out if the PBMC made interferon gamma. I find out if we change the frequency of circulating regulatory T cells. But that might have been the wrong question. And it might have been, did I change the suppression of MDSC um, in the tumor microenvironment? Maybe there's a signature in the tumor that's critical. And those weren't the two questions that I bet my money on. So there was um, an excellent uh, editorial that I can recommend to everyone interested in uh, this topic that was in Nature Biotechnology last fall. And it was talking about uh, a terrific uh, uh, a meeting that uh, was about immune profiling. But it points out that immune profiling is still in the pilot stage in a lot of set, uh, settings. We've got fantastic new technologies able to do these, but we don't yet have a robust pile of data showing how effective they are in identifying patients. So they're at pilot uh, scale, and each of these may have different uh, specimen requirements. So we need to know what we should be saving in order to harness these and find out if any of these new high throughput technologies are going to point us in the right direction. Um, often, uh, for a, again, example, in, in my trial, I've saved a certain kind of specimen for a certain kind of purpose, but I didn't save everything for every purpose, so I don't have plasma for circulating tumor DNA, for example. And so um, uh, drug companies don't have incentive to fund unsupervised analyses and hypothesis generating analyses. So um, uh, and the grants support the critical scientific question that investigator wanted to answer. But there isn't a mechanism for saving a lot of different types of samples for unspecified future research to identify the biomarkers we need. When you read studies on immunotherapy uh, and immune biomarkers, um, you sometimes read a very basic level. 
we've got some hospital labs we ran to monitor toxicity and uh, we had uh, we've got a pd1 and so we looked at pdl1 in tumors by one of the five assays you heard about earlier today that's being used all with different antibodies and different cutoffs but they used one or maybe they ran several standardized cellular assays something for effector cells something for suppressor cells um, and looked mostly in the blood because the tumor is hard to get. Or perhaps there are studies where um, they ran those great brand new technologies, high throughput profiling, where they have a very exciting signature. And that's very preliminary and that's piloted. And we don't know if that's going to pan out or not. And that's something new that there is no basis for comparison between this study and that study. So this is, uh, this is what I usually read when I go through the literature to see what, uh, what is going on in the field. There are uh, a lot of things that we can save. We can save tumor, and in uh, most pathology laboratories, there's going to be some sort of non-viable tumor sample saved from some sort of diagnostic. But there isn't going to be viable tumor that's been cryopreserved as a single cell suspension from which we can do functional assays. Um, and so you heard from Dr. Rosenberg this morning that if we had viable tumor, then we've got what we need to do adoptive T cell therapy later on if that's called for. Um, but we often don't have that. Um, in, uh, in my own study in a, an institution that values uh, biomarker research, I told them that I would need some surgical biopsies to do tumor studies. And they said, so uh, core, is a core good for you? I said, no. There's no viable cells I can get out of a core. I need a surgical biopsy. And that was going to be a hurdle. Um, from blood, do we want serum? Do we want plasma? Well, it depends on the analyte, and there aren't a lot of data um, uh, to compare those two. It would be wonderful if we could do fresh testing on whole blood. To do that, you have to have the money up front. But if you have the money up front and you have whole blood coming into the lab fresh, you've got absolute counts and percentages. So if you think your regulatory T cells went down, it may be because you have the wrong denominator all the CD4s went down, and the Tregs are still the same percentage of CD4s that they always were. And without absolute counts and percentages, you don't know that. So there are um, a lot of different biospecimens to save and a lot of different requirements uh, for the different questions we need to ask of them. So uh, the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer did get together a, a couple of working groups on standardization and validation and um, uh, novel technologies um, back in about 2009 and came up with a series of recommendations that basically could be summed up as control the variables you can control and test for the variables that you can't control. So if you've saved biospecimens, save enough for your current questions that you've thought of and the questions you're going to think of later, um, and save them under standard operating procedures um, with well-trained staff so that it doesn't matter whether the student got the specimen to bank today and the postdoc got it the next day, that you always know that everything is saved the same way under the same procedures. And then save that tumor uh, sample and uh, the genomic DNA of the patient so we can understand the variability we can't control, the patient-to-patient -patient variability and all of the tumor-to-tumor -tumor variability. So, um, and also, of course, uh, describing full details of what you did so that we can understand what you did and what it means. So for, uh, like, uh, some of our, our colleagues in the room, I think a lot about vaccines. The biomarker for my vaccine may be different from the biomarker for everyone else's vaccine, and the vaccine-like effects promoting anti-tumor immunity may be different if it came from a chemotherapy intervention than if it came from a dendritic cell vaccine or a viral vaccine. And the identified biomarker from the vaccine may not be the same biomarker anymore if we've combined it with something. So as you've heard also uh, earlier, it's a complicated system. So where do we have signals? We, we do have certainly a number of prognostic signals uh, from different studies uh, that are um, tested in multiple trials, first in small trials and then replicated in larger multi-institution trials. So in this case, based on um, earlier work from Pam Sharma at MD Anderson and others, um, we had a large-scale study of ipilimumab uh, plus or minus GMCSF. This is Steve Hody's study that ran through the ECOG-Akron Cooperative Group. This was a positive study showing that uh, GMCSF 
SF addition could uh, reduce some toxicity and pr improve clinical outcome from ipilimumab. And so we looked, among other things, at ICOS expression. And as shown previously, we were able to confirm in this setting as well that if there's more ICOS on the CD8 and CD4 T cells in these patients, those are the patients who are doing better. <coughs> So prognostic uh, signals, um, but not predictive uh, enrollment criterion sort of signals. My, um, uh, my own favorite biomarker is uh, determinant spreading. So perhaps the difference between a responder and a non-responder in a vaccine study is that we can activate T cells against anything and almost anyone against any of these self-shared antigens. But perhaps it's those patients whose tumors opened up and released all those private or endogenous antigens and antigens we haven't discovered or the mutated antigens you heard about this morning. Those are the patients who then have that antigen release in an immune stimulatory way that allow that spreading of the response from a vaccine-induced shared antigen response to uh, perhaps a higher avidity, more effective uh, private antigen response. But how do you develop an assay for this biological uh, uh, process? Um, that's a, a challenge um, that we're trying to address. So perhaps something that's a little simpler, something where we can agree upon how to measure it, regulatory T cells. There have been a number of consensus statements about how to measure circulating regulatory T cells in patients. And so this, um, we know how to phenotype them, we know how to measure them, and we know a number of their biological effects. Um, so perhaps this is a, a biomarker that can cut across different types of interventions and in different types of patients. And in the lovely review of uh, Galan and Friedman, where they looked at um, the measures of uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, where many studies agree a good infiltrate is a type 1 interferon gamma producing CD8 T cell response. What we don't agree about at the end with the arrow on it is whether regulatory T cells infiltrating that tumor is good or bad. We think of these as suppressive cells, and yet when uh, Galan and Friedman went through the literature and summarized um, whether infiltrating T regs was good or bad, it was completely mixed. So is that because we're measuring them differently, because we're only looking at one marker by immunohistochemistry instead of by flow cytometry by five markers? Um, that I don't think is clear, but um, the field isn't clear whether regulatory T cells or TH17 or TH2 cells in the tumor are really good or bad. So perhaps that's not something yet that we understand well enough to make a biomarker from. Perhaps myeloid dwarf suppressor cells. These are cells that have come up in a number of studies as being very potent suppressive cells, suppressing anti-tumor immunity, again, by a number of different uh, mechanisms. Um, in mice, measuring these is pretty straightforward. There are two or three markers that pretty much everyone uses that are clear. In humans, uh, we've got about 10 different subsets that are being followed to try to understand which type of immature myeloid cell or myeloid drive suppressor cell activated or not is the cell that is really hampering anti-tumor immunity. Um, and uh, based on a recent proficiency panel and gating strategy, everyone in this room gates the cells differently, even if it's based on the same markers. So for this, I think we still need even standardization in how to measure uh, these cells. So what's new in biomarkers? We've got entire new areas of biology impacting anti-tumor immunity, metabolism, microbiome, and the immune effects of uh, signal transduction pathway modulation. Um, we've got amazing new high-throughput technologies uh, that can measure uh, different aspects of immune response, mass cytometry, sequencing, TCR diversity, epigenetics, many more questions uh, that we're able to ask in a more efficient way from a variety of samples. We've got new and old drugs that are affecting immunity. We've got chemotherapy, standard of care, um, and as well as vaccines that are modulating anti-tumor immunity. And we also need um, informatics approaches that can integrate all of these types of data uh, that can bring these uh, different types of readouts together. So what's limiting uh, our uh, identification of relevant immune biomarkers um, and actionable mechanisms of action? Um, one, um, R21 and R01 investigator grants to the NCI that are supposed to uh, fund um, hypothesis generating or hypothesis testing immunotherapy biomarker studies are not competitive if that grant has to be in the top 10 to 15 percent of all of the grants submitted in the study section. 
So just writing a grant to fund that part um, is not uh, currently a successful approach. Um, part of the things uh, I'm involved in are, is ECOG Akron is the immunology reference laboratory for that cooperative group. And now you're uh, barred from submitting trials with exploratory biomarkers. It's disallowed. You can have an integral or an integrated biomarker, and that makes sense if you need to know whether someone's BRAF mutated or not so that they can get the BRAF inhibitor or not. But for immunotherapy biomarkers, there is no integral biomarker, yet they're all exploratory. So this is a hurdle um, in the multi-institution uh, trial setting for us to even be able to ask the question. Um, the National Clinical Trials Network um, in the current funding period is not allowed to support more than one laboratory. So now the specialized laboratories uh, in ECOG Akron, there used to be five. And so now that has to shrink over the next five years to one laboratory that's going to have to develop the expertise to handle all of the types of samples and do all of the banking that's appropriate for all of these different questions that we need to ask. Um, and there uh, do exist banks within the cooperative groups, within single institutions, within cancer centers, where there are uh, banks of samples available, but our access to them and our knowledge of them uh, is limiting. And so that's another area, I think, for improvement um, as we try to uh, answer these questions. So in my last three slides, I'll share with you uh, what the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer is um, working on to, uh, to try to push this area of the field forward. Um, the society has always had an interest in immune monitoring and immunotherapy biomarkers with a series of white papers. And the previous um, working group recommendations paper I cited earlier um, from uh, 2011. So what we've done uh, this time is the same steering committee has come together and instead of two working groups, we have four because the field has exploded and we have so many more questions and so many more opportunities to try to give some guidance. And so we've got groups on assay standardization and invalidation again, the uh, biomarker new assays and technologies, um, immune regulation and systemic uh, modulation, high throughput approaches, and then baseline immunity and tumor microenvironment. So we've got a um, series of experts from um, industry and government and academia working together to reevaluate those data and make recommendations. The preamble uh, was published about a year ago now. Working Group uh, Two's paper just came out. Um, and we've also set out a series of uh, uh, one pagers, which really means four pages, of technology reports that show what the level of evidence is about all of these great new technologies, what kinds of samples they need banked in order to be used. Um, and then we're doing a clinical trial analysis project, and much of this will be discussed in a meeting uh, at the NIH on April 1st. No foolin'. And in my last, uh, so you'll remember, um, in my last slide, um, We've got uh, one other project that after uh, two years of going through the approval process through the ECOG Akron system, um, we finally do have approved and contracts done uh, to be able to take that positive trial, the ipilimumab plus or minus GM trial, and use those bank specimens as a demonstration trial. So we're going to do standardized cellular assays, circulating mediators, and molecular studies um, in a collaboration with the uh, Sidra Institute in Doha, Qatar, under Franco Marincola's direction, and hopefully um, uh, some opportunities like this will uh, will help us understand better what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So I'll stop there. Thank you.